Welcome to Revelation part three. This is a continuation of the Revelation series that we started some times back. Today, we're going to deal with the next four churches. And I'm going to lay some settings of the church of Thyatira. And these settings help us to kind of like expound what Jesus was referring to, because some of the symbols that the Lord used was something particular to that church in that particular time, depending on the circumstances of the church. So let me just lay a little bit of a background of, of, of this ancient church of Veritira. Jesus is introducing himself as an all-seeing and discerning God. In fact, he says, I discern minds and hearts of men. So let's have these two things. The city as a secular city that has a pretty good developed industry in clothing, in dyeing and pottery. And then remember the lady, uh, Lydia, who was the first convert of Paul in Philippi, who was a seller of purple from this city of Thyatira. You can read that in the book of Acts chapter 16. And then that establishes that they were pretty, you know, pretty business-like city. And then having known that city, it's pretty secular. It has no particular religion uh, in this area. And we see Jesus himself introducing himself as the God whom John saw with a flaming fire or eyes like fire. He says, he who has the, fl the eyes like the flames of fire and feet like bronze says this to the church of Thyatira. What does that mean? Let's first explain that symbol. Jesus with all seeing eyes, like the flames of fire, means he's all seeing and he discerns, his feet discerns because they're like bronze, fine bronze. That kind of uh, purity is, is the one that sees through and through. So the Lord is a seer of the minds and the hearts of men. And we talk about the mind, uh, we're talking about the soul. And when you talk about the reins, we're talking about the kidneys. That has to do with the emotions, you know what I mean? And the heart is the soul, the mind. So he can discern the human mind and the human intentions and emotions very, very deeply, even more than we can ever imagine. So having established that, that Jesus is trying to, you know, put, to show himself as a discerner of hearts and minds, and he's in this city, complained of the church being tolerant of a woman called Jezebel. And Jesus gives a very stern warning concerning this woman because she labels this woman as a false prophet. He, Jesus labels this woman as the one who destroys the people of God, as the one who leads the church of their Tyrell and some of its members astray. He's leading them astray. So this is a very dangerous woman that Jesus is warning the people. And he goes ahead and says, whomsoever has slept with this woman is going to be punished. Not only sleeping with this woman, this woman seems to have some children. He says, some people sired children with this woman who is a false prophetess. Jesus issues a very stern warning that he's going to kill the children and punish those who have been sleeping around with this Jezebel. And I think it's important for us to understand and go back uh, to understand and go back to the word of God and try to see who is this Jezebel? Who was Jezebel? Jezebel was the most evil woman to ever have lived as listed in Israel. And she was a she was a, a wife of King Ahab and she seemed to be the one who controlled Ahab. Ahab being the man, the masculine a representation of the masculine man and this woman is a, f a feminine the feminine self of a woman but it seems to have taken control of the man so she was controlling the the king the king ahab and she was a very evil woman the bible portrays her as this woman who is just concerned about her outward appearance who was always painting herself and controlled the man and controlled the king she was effectually running the kingdom at that point because Ahab was kind of like more subservient to this woman and this woman is a dangerous woman because she represents a spirit of a queen of a commanding queen of a controlling queen of a queen who is controlling the kingdom of evil and we see that she is after the prophets because she's she was immediately after Elijah you know, confronted the prophets, uh, the prophets of Baal and killed some of them when they could not prove that their God was real. 
Ahab, uh, not Ahab, but the Queen Jezebel was after the Prophet. And the Prophet is running away from uh, Jezebel who swears to kill him. So Jezebel is a killer of Prophets. The killer and the finisher of the people of God. She wants to quench the fire of God in every man of God and a woman of God. She is against the kingdom of God. She's against the prophets. She's against the Holy Spirit, who is the spirit of prophecy. The spirit of Jesus is a spirit of prophecy. So we see this Jezebel is a woman who attacks the, the spirit of God. And Jesus is using the same name to the church of their Tyra, that they're they're tolerating this kind of a spirit, the spirit of a false prophet, the spirit of Jezebel who controls, who stops the, the people of God, who prevents the people of God. And she uses her own sexual appeal. She's a very sensual woman. She uses sensuality to lure people to, to them, beauty, painting. You know, she, 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 she's, she pretty much, when you think about it, she, she's using pornea. You know, pornea in Greek is pornography, we can say this days, these days. It's that allure. Is that charm of a woman of 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 sensual charm to lure, especially men and men of God in particular, to bring them into sin and slavery, into sexual immorality, and but we see here she has a spirit of prophecy, and this prophecy is a false prophet. Jesus refers to her as a false prophet, and Jesus says those who have actually. Uh, taken up the, the, the doctrine of Jezebel, that sexual immorality, uh, false prophet, and thinking that you can serve God, both God, Jesus Christ, and still do sexual immorality and practice the doctrines of Jezebel and still be all right. He said, those who have actually tested or tasted the depths of Satan need to repent, need to be zealous and repent from this doctrine of Jezebel and get away from her because she was to get punishment. Uh, from God, not only the false prophet, but those practicing those doctrines. In summary, we're saying Jezebel is a false prophetess from hell. Jezebel is a master of all concupiscence. Jezebel is a destroyer of true prophets. Jezebel is a seducer of servants of God. Jezebel is a controller of man. And she's also a witch. And she lures people through sexual immorality. And she, after luring them from God through sexual immorality, they end up eating food sacrificed to idols. We may not understand right now in this, in, in our current you know, age, what it means to food sacrifice to idols. Probably pre people from Asia would understand. But for us, it's anything that is dedicated to Satan. In our current, you know, contemporary, you know, contemporary world, it's more of, Things that Satan has taken ownership to, including music, videos, movies. There are many diabolical things that Satan claims ownership of that we, we per participate in, we partake of. We partake of those. That means we're eating things that are dedicated to Satan or, or Satan has, has claimed ownership over. So we should be very, very careful what Jezebel, it's a spirit. Jezebel is a spirit. It's not just one specific uh, woman. It's a kingdom of Satan that is more into luring people into sexual immorality and participating into things that are dedicated to Satan, that is things sacrificed to idols, including music, say things like pornography, uh, things like X-rated and, and music that, that, that curses and blasphemes God or gives praise to Satan or cartoons. There are many things, even some types of clothes, some types of tattoos, you know, uh, it's all those things that are dedicated and very diabolical that has to do with Satan that we participate in knowingly or unknowingly. So the works or the work of this spirit of Jezebel in church is to, to just be, lead the people of God astray. And this is, I'm talking in our contemporary world, but go back to the church of Thyatira, they had the same problem. And at that time, it seems like in the church, people used to use the, the term, the depths of Satan. You know, some are, that means there is a degree to which you can get into Satanism or to know the devil. Some do it ignorantly. Some are in level two. Others are way too deep into it. So, uh, so some are very deep in the levels of occult. So it's not just, which, which, which means false teaching occult, you know. So some really knowingly are in there knowingly. Others are halfway. Others are just towing around, but they're different uh, depths to Satan or a cult. So Jesus said, the only way you can defeat the spirit of Jezebel 
He called the, the church of Thyatira to repent. It's through repentance. Jezebel, you have to repent of all sexual immorality or anything that has to do with sensuality and concupiscence of the flesh. Concupiscence of the flesh is just fleshly lust and desire. Everything that just culminates into sexual gratification, which is a lie, it has part of it. It's part of life, but it's not everything. But you see the modern society, we have all this sexualization of everything. That is the very spirit of Jezebel where they want us to be contaminated and our consciences to always, you know, uh, uh, be, be, be dirtied or, or muddied by these sexual images. So we, we are very hyper-sexualized, uh, hyper-sexualized society. That's the spirit of Jezebel in the church. So we have learned that the only way to defeat this, Jesus said, you need to repent. So repentance is very, very important. I, I can't stress it more that when you repent, you are able to defeat this spirit of Jezebel uh, that is a very active in the kingdom of the devil. She's a very powerful queen because she, she, she almost acts like the king. She's a very powerful kingdom. And if you repent, repentance from especially sexual immorality is one way of beating it. Jesus said, said straight to the church, repent. Uh, there is something here that I would like to add that we have learned that Jezebel has children. That Jesus said, um, those who are in the cultish doctrine of Jezebel, Jesus said, I'm going to kill their illegitimate children. That means Jezebel bears children. When you entertain that sexual immorality and diabolical thing, sacrifice to the devil, you technically are breeding, uh, you're breeding children and they grow. These children grow. That's how you get into the depths of, of sexual immorality. But once you repent, you're actually killing those babies. So do not entertain demons. Do not, do not feed these demons because they grow. They, they, they start very small, you know, just like the ovum and the sperm. And then they grow. Do not feed into these sexual lusts and desires. And the way you do it, the way you kill them, you kill the children of Jezebel is to repent. That's how you kill them. But if you keep feeding into this, you're going to grow deeper and deeper and deeper and become entangled in the whole satanic sexual lust, sexual immorality that is going to lead to others and others and more and more into the depths of Satan. Before you know it, you're two way entangled. So Jesus is telling us the way to kill these, these children of Jezebel is through repentance. So repent at all times. And this, if you have been already, you know, uh, entangled into sexual immorality, pornography, masturbation, every time of an every type of un uncleanliness, uh, fornication, adultery, you know, um, unnatural sexual desires, bestiality, attractions to children, any type of 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 that kind of immorality, repentance is a place is a place to start your deliverance. From the spirit of Jezebel. So sexual immorality is not just something that affects you. First God who gave the law. Who wants to be honored. So first we disrespect and hurt God by diso disobedience. Then secondly it's us actually. We hurt ourselves through sexual immorality. Because of sexual transmitted diseases. Because of 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 interacting with the devil and Jezebel and Satan and mixing all these demons between you and the other partner who is you are sinning with. So you, number three, it affects others as well because if you're a man or a woman just using people, you're using them as objects and actually there, you know, there is something we call the sanctity of life. You should respect others. So you're hurting them. If, for example, you're giving them sexually transmitted diseases and, and unwanted, unwanted pregnancies and stuff like that. Um, secondly, it, it, it hurts families because when you sin, it brings about divorce that ends up hurting children and those children, you know, they become traumatized. So it not only hurts God, our, uh, ourselves, ourselves, it, it hurts others. It hurts communities, families. And when families are hurt, the, the churches are hurt as well. The communities are hurt as well. So sexual immorality is not something to, to, to joke around with. It hurts everyone around us. So we need to repent. We need to come out of Jezebel. We need to come out of the depths of Satan and repent and walk with the Lord. Jesus says for those who repent and reject this doctrine of Jezebel, he was going to give them the morning star. And we know that the morning star is Jesus himself. He's saying, I'm going, I'm going to give myself to you.
this is a great promise. Jesus is, is, is God is saying, I'm going to give you, I'm going to be your reward, which is an amazing promise for those who repent and, and stay on course with the Lord. And he says, not only shall I give myself to you as a morning star, I'm, you're going to rule with me with authority. So we, we're going to reign with him and rule, rule with him. So that's an amazing and, and a good, like something to look forward to and to make us zealous about repenting and avoiding everything to do with Jezebel. Thyatira, all they needed to do is avoid uh, the spirit of Jezebel, to avoid Jezebel and her cultish doctrines and repent. That's how they were supposed to be victorious and get the promises of the Lord. And the Lord introduced himself as the God who has the eyes like fire, who sees, you know, he sees the rains, the kidneys. The kidneys is a seed of, you know, emotions. We talked about emotions, uh, the hearts. The heart is the mind and the heart, which is a seed of intellect. So he sees your intellect. He sees your emotions way deep than you can ever imagine. So the Lord is an all-seeing God. Let us hide nothing before, uh, before him because everything lies naked and he can see through and through. So repentance, and I guess that's all we 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 have to talk about uh, the the Church of uh, Thyatira. Uh, we're going to go to the next church that the Lord asked John to write to. That is the Church of Sardis. The Church of Sardis. We're going to use the same uh, setting that we're using. The setting, lay a background, go back to history, then talk about how the Lord is introducing himself, what he's accusing or 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 commanding, commanding the church for, and then we're going to see what lesson do we learn as a new as a church, the current uh, contemporary church. So Sardis, I'm going to lay uh, some setting on the church of Sardis here. Sardis was a very wealthy city. It had two locations. One was an older location that was in a mountain. But this city looks to have grown and there, there was a huge population growth from the mountain, you know, mountainous city. And they, they spread down out from the mountains into the valley below. So they had two locations, the old city on the mountains and the new, newer city because of the population and the outburst of growth on the valley surrounding the mountain. So there is not much, you know, in ancient history about this, except that it was located on a mountain and below the mountain. And it was a very, very wealthy city. So when you, we talk about Sardis, think about wealth. This is a very wealthy city. It has an old, old now this is not downtown. It's top town, the old top town. Now down is a new one. And it's a, it's a pretty wealthy city. Think about the wealth. They were enjoying uh, the benefits of being wealthy. And here we see Jesus introduces himself as one who has seven spirits of God and the seven leaders of the churches. Jesus introduces himself and says, I'm the one who have the seven spirits of God. Here, when you talk about the seven spirits, it's not a, it's, you should not think of it like just a plural, like the Holy Spirit is, it's, it's seven. It's just the Holy Spirit is one, and Jesus is the giver of the Holy Spirit. But he says there are seven spirits of God. And in the Bible, we can see seven is perfection. And we can see in the book of Isaiah, uh, Jesus is the one who has the seven spirits of God. That is the spirit of wisdom, spirit of understanding, spirit of might, spirit of, 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 of the fear of the Lord, and the spirit of God. You can see all the seven attributes of the Holy Ghost there. But he's the same one Holy Spirit. So Jesus is a giver of the Holy Spirit. And for him, he says, I have the seven stars. That is the seven leaders of the churches. Uh, that means perfection. You know, it, it, it denotes the perfection of the Holy Spirit and the perfection of, of the church that Jesus died for. Um, Jesus is warning this church in Sardis. The church in Sardis is being warned to hold on to the little fire that remained and to be watchful and to strengthen what was on the verge of dying so the lord is telling them this church is dwindling and there is kind of like uh, nice elements left 
but they're about to die. So Jesus is like, I want you to hold on to that because if that dies, you're, you're all dead. The church has no light anymore. So hold on to what's left. It's good. A lot of it has degraded. It looks like this was a degrading church. Remember, we talked about the world in the beginning. The world of the old town at the top of the mountain. Now it's growing on the valley here. A lot of wealth. It's a busy city because of the wealth. But the church is dwindling. And the Lord is saying, oh, hold on to that which is left. You know, the, the, the good, the little good morals that is left. The little good works that's left. The little faith that's left. Hold on to that. Jesus would go ahead and label this church as the living dead. It, I think it's a very sad state of a church a well, living dead church is the one that appears to be pretty good on the outside you know living dead it's like when you say something is living and dead it's it's a paradox because it, it's apparently and seemingly looks like it's a looks like it's alive but it's dead on the inside so it takes a person with discernment to see the inside that this thing is dead but literally when you seemingly it looks like it's alive so it's a paradox of of, of a facade something that is you know a facade is something that looks so good but it's just the top veneer that's good behind it is just rottenness so i would say this is one of the saddest state of the church that i have read in the book of revelation out of the seven churches where they they have a name they're renowned they seem to be renowned you know you seem to be known by name you're you're a huge name even the the pastors the the, the bishops the leaders in the church have a name worldwide you have a huge following you have many likes but you're just you have a good name you're renowned but according to jesus we're dead inside so it's up to you and me to think, yes, we might we might be portraying a very nice picture on the outside, but who are you on the inside? What does Jesus see you? Are you dead and people do not know? Just because we are appearing, showing to church, well-dressed, people might see us, you know, well-oiled and well, you know, uh, uh, groomed. But are we such inside? That's a question. A church with a good reputation, but spiritually dead. Dangerous place to be, indeed. Jesus is offering them to go back to the basics of the gospel. Without complicating it, the gospel has to be offered in its simplicity. That it has to do with salvation through grace by the death of our Lord Jesus Christ and repentance to sin and sticking to the basics of Christianity. That's what should revive a dead person without getting complicated. The gospel is pretty easy. Jesus has paid the price and paid the price. And it's by grace that we receive this and we maintain it. We receive it by repentance and obtaining this new life in Christ Jesus, a new personality, a new life in living a life that is worthy of that repentance, life that is worthy of honoring the dead and the suffering of Christ. That is a life of holiness, a life of walking with the Lord, simple gospel. If we go back to that and repent, then the deadness that is on the inside shall be removed and the dead bones will arise again. And the Lord is going to give us this new life through that. Remember, the Lord introduced himself as the one who has the seven spirit. So that has to, to do with the only one who can help us remove the deadness that is inside. Who would that be? The Holy Spirit. So Jesus is a baptizer or the giver of the Holy Spirit. So we need to ask the Holy Spirit from the Father through Jesus Christ so that the deadness within can be brought back to life. This living dead church, we have talked about the remedies being just repentance and going back to the basics of Christianity. Because some of us want to complicate it and we end up getting confused. And in the end, it's that simple gospel that is able to save the, the power of God. It may be appear as foolishness to the world, but it's a power of God. The simplicity of the gospel sometimes appears as foolishness to others. So that without complicating, we need to go back to basics. Repentance. Dying to the old self. Dying to sin. Dying to the body of rottenness. And asking the Holy Spirit especially for those who went back this i would like to use this setting of this sardis church to appeal to those who backslid to appeal to those who are lukewarm to appeal to those who are kind of like 
living a double life, living dead. You know, you appear to be okay, but you know inside something is not okay. And you know that you're, you're, you're lacking in something. Something is, you're, you're lacking in something. That means you need the seven spirit of God that Jesus holds. That is the Holy Spirit. We already discussed that. So it's time to go back to the Holy Spirit, to repent, go back to the basics. Asking the Holy Spirit to come and revive and remove all the deadness and rottenness so we can become alive in the Lord Jesus Christ. What did, what did Jesus promise this church if they overcame? He promised them white raiment. White raiment and he promised them that they're guaranteed they will be in the book of life. So there is a huge uh, reward for those who maintain holiness and righteousness through repentance and to holding on to what is good and, and removing the deadness within us through repentance. Again, repentance, this word is coming over and over again to the letters of the churches. So it's a very, I don't know, it's not preached that much these days, but the only way you can accept the gospel of Jesus is to repent. And to repent means to turn around, to take the life of Jesus. You, you, you must deny your old life and then take the life of Jesus and he helps you walk this journey of salvation. So the great promise that there is no way you get a guarantee that you're in the book of life, the, the Lamb's book of life. And then you get a guarantee that you shall be clothed in white raiment that, that denotes, you know, purity. You're set apart for God. That purity, that is a future honor, you know, the future honor and eternal life to those who stand in faith. You know, the purity, the honor, being, 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 being clothed in, in white raiment. So this is as far as the Church of Sardis goes. There is a lot we can take from this church as a contemporary church, contemporary people of this age. Again and again, the Holy Spirit is showing up. Repentance is showing up and going back to the basics, standing strong in the faith, not compromising. It's coming up again. It's a simple, basic gospel that we need to go back to. Uh, we will be going ahead and tackling the, the Church of Philadelphia. The, the city of Philadelphia was established by the citizens of Pergamos. The citizens of Pergamos, remember we discussed about the Church of Pergamon. They established this city again. You know, they established a city called Philadelphia. And what they managed to do is they managed to keep the barbarians out of the region and they brought in the Greek culture. So anyone who was not Greek was kept out, who were called barbarians, you know, like the, the outcasts. They're not Greek, you know, non-Greek people. They managed to, in this city, to keep the barbarians out and they, they brought in the Greek culture, you know. And just remember the Church of Pergamon, they had some problem because of the Greek culture and the worship of before cults we talked about. You can see that in series uh, two of Revelation. So they established another city. And again, they kept all the other cultures out of the barbarians as they were referred then. And only the Greek culture was prevalent in this city as well and the language of the Greeks. Just to mention here a bit, a little bit of history this city was destroyed by an earthquake in AD 17, you know, after Jesus' uh, death. 17 years later, this city was flattened and destroyed by an earthquake. And it is also said that after this earthquake, that people were afraid to live in the city. And they actually left the city and they were living in the outskirts of the city. And that's how, you know, the, this, this whole city and probably the church that was present then was annihilated by this earthquake um and when we talk about the barbarians we're talking about the non-greek and here it would be they kept out the medes and the persians out of this city so it was more of a greek place you know what i mean so and here it's important to know how did jesus introduce himself when he talked about the church of, of philadelphia jesus introduced himself as one who holds the key of david Jesus told John when he specifically spoke to to told him to write to the church of Philadelphia he introduces himself as the one who holds the key of David the key of David 
it's a key that opens something when you hear when you think of a key it's a, it's a to open something it denotes authority and i think here i'm going to lay a little bit of background according to the scriptures when you talk about the key of david uh, usually after david is gone up until the king hezekiah who who inherits the throne or the state house or the white house whatever you call it in he, he he inherits the throne of david and the house of david and he had this like like a general or or the key servant in the house whose name was um eliakim so eliakim is responsible to 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 to, to the castle to be to all the rooms in the key, key in the in the, in the in David's throne so he technically could lock out the king he could lock Hezekiah in he had that much authority because he had the key to every room in the throne of David in the castle of David so we see this is a very authoritative figure that has a power to open and close so when Jesus says i have the key of David he is technically saying saying I, I i open and close i have the authority to let you in into the kingdom of david that is heaven i i, I let people in heaven or i lock you out i have the power to, to 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 save and i have the power to condemn he's actually you know just um talking about his authority and i think we have already talked about if you read isaiah 22 and 21 Isaiah 22 and 21, you can get the story of Eliakim, Eliakim the steward who carried the key of the palace of David. That is when King Hezekiah inherited it. So Jesus is the only way to heaven. It's, it says without him, you can't enter the palace of David. Without Jesus opening as Eliakim was opening the palace of David. He had the keys to open every chamber, even to the room of David. If he locked it, the king that time was hezekiah would be locked in he had to wait for him so it's it's he's a very important person to let you in or out he can lock you in or out so jesus has the authority to save he is the only way to heaven he opens and no one closes he closes and no one opens that's the authority of jesus christ so once we have established whom the lord wants to be seen as when he's talking to to, to philadelphia he wants to assert and talk about his authority and him being the only way to heaven, being the only way to a place, to the palace, the, the palace of God, heaven, the way to the Father. Jesus is commending this church for a few things. He says that they kept faith, even with a little strength. He says they have good works and he says they're patient in tribulation. So this church, the church around here, because of the settings we talks about, was facing tribulation and the lord is commending them for being faithful even when they had little strength he says they had good works and they were patient in tribulation so jesus is commending them for something the church under tribulation but is patient still trying to do good work even when oppressed by the culture around philadelphia the greek culture they were able to maintain faith even when they were pretty weak, they had little strength. Jesus would come here and say, he knows the problem there. There were, there were some Jews that were persecuting the Christian. They never liked the Christ message, the Jews. And Jesus would condemn these Jews and call them and call their synagogue, the synagogue of Satan, the religious people of um, Judaism, Ju propagating Judaism and persecuting the Christians, even up to, 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 to the Romans. Uh, he would call them the Jews of the church of the synagogue of Satan. Um, what, what Jesus told this church is just to hold on. So this church is doing well in the midst of a very secular Greek, you know, infested culture. The church is doing well. It's being persecuted by the Jews and they're holding on and Jesus is commending them. What Jesus says is, you guys just hold on. Do not let any other man take your crown. You know, like these men already have a crown. That's a reward in heaven. He's telling them, don't let them. Hold on, man. Let them persecute you. Know what you're fighting for. Your reward is great in heaven. Do not let any man, 
you know, derail you from your focus. Your focus is heaven. You know, I have the key to let you, you know, I'm the only one who can let you in. And I have a key and I'll let you in. Do not let anyone let you lose the focus on the prize that is the crown of heaven. So fight. Do not let anything, do not let any man, do not let any friends, do not let any influence you know, uh, lose, make you lose focus on what the promise, the great hope, the glorious hope we have in Christ Jesus, even hereafter this life. Jesus is telling us here, do not let anyone make you lose your reward. Hold fast to the faith and use the spiritual asset that I've given you to, 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 to stand firm and to do good works. There is great rewards to come. First to this church, he told them, I'm going to make those Jews know that I am with you and they're going to come and worship at your feet. They're going to say, yeah, truly, Jesus is the Lord. So he promised them that was an immediate something to do with that church, that he was going to convince and do something that the Jews would know that he is a Messiah and they would come to the church and worship at their feet and repent and say, we understand Jesus is Lord. So that was one of the promises to the church then. And... He told the church then that he would keep them from the hour of temptation. Apparently, it looked like it, it was a worldwide event that was happening. Some type of a temptation. Who knows what that was? Was it a pandemic? Was it some... some? No one knows what it's not listed. But we knew it's something that was happening worldwide. And the Lord promised specifically this time around that he was going to keep them from that. The church was exempted. The whole world would suffer. But the, Jesus would do some special favor and keep them from that hour of temptation. So that was a nice kind of a nice thing then. Uh, I don't know how much that translates to us, but that was more to the church of Philadelphia. But we see here, the Lord is promising them a permanent place in the new, new Jerusalem. So this relates to us as well. Those who hold fast to, to the faith will have a permanent place in new Jerusalem. In whose key to new Jerusalem is in the hands of Jesus, our Lord and our Savior. He's going to open for us and we have a permanent place in heaven. What a promise. What an amazing promise. And then Jesus would tell, and then Jesus would say that he has left them an open door. Remember, he has a key to open. So it, heaven is open for us. Heaven was open for the church of Philadelphia. He told them, I leave you an open door free to enter heaven is free man he told them i have the key it's open for you guys it's open door just enter take in whatever you want the kingdom belongs to the father and it's the father's will to give us the kingdom so freely enter so we have an open door in jesus christ to that new jerusalem to 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 spiritual favors of god we should go like a buffet and feed on anything we want in Christ Jesus. There is an open door. Hallelujah. And we're going to tackle the last church here. That is the church of Laodicea. The church of Laodicea. Again, we're going to lay some settings here about the church of Laodicea. Jesus introduces himself as the Amen. The faithful witness. And the beginning of, of, of all creation. The beginning of creation of God. What Jesus is talking about here, he is the word of God. When he say, I'm the amen, amen, and let it be so. I am the, the, the witness, the faithful witness. He's, he was there because God used the word that Jesus Christ to create. He was there at the beginning. He's a witness that God created uh, everything using his word. Jesus was the word incarnate that was made flesh so jesus is saying i am the word of god the amen the faithful witness in the beginning of creation of god god spoke the first thing god did before creation is speaking the word speaking jesus that's jesus right there uh, jesus is introducing himself as the word of god and just to lay a little bit of setting as we have been, we have been doing for all the churches Laodicea was the wealthiest of all the seven churches. It was the most wealthy. So we see it's, a, it's the wealthiest of all the cities. It has a banking industry. It has a manufacturing industry of wool. And it has a medical school. Because the Lord is talking about the, 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 the produce, the eye 
salve, you know, some ointment for the eyes. So they had a medical school as well. So very wealthy of all the seven churches. We also understand that this city had some issues with the water supply. Um, it had issues with supplying water and they had built some dikes to bring in hot water from the hot springs to the city. But we understand that this water supply, in order to solve it, they had some aqueducts that were built from the hot spring, bringing in hot water to the city. But by the time that hot water, you know, flowed through the aqueducts, by the time it reached the city, it was neither cold nor hot. So the same problem that they were trying to resolve to make the water hot, to get you know, hot water from the hot springs into the city, it ended up not being effective and bringing in some very uh, undesirable waters that are neither hot nor cold. Uh, the water was an interestingly unpleasant. The water was repugnant. The water was not, was not even good to drink. It was uh, distasteful, not only distasteful, unpleasant and desirable you know a lot of verbiage there to try to describe this water that is nowhere it's nowhere you know it's not good and the only reason i'm bringing this point is to see the symbolism that the lord used when describing this church because the lord would call this church the, the one of the problem of this church is being lukewarm and the lord knew about this water problem that they were trying to resolve which ended up not being pleasant, not being what it was intended to be. It was somewhere in between. It was disgusting. So the Lord would tell the church, the church in Laodicea, that it was a lukewarm church. It was undesirable. It was uninteresting. It was distasteful. It was repugnant. It was nowhere. It was neither holy, neither sinful. It was neither for faith, neither and believing. It was just a mix of something that was undesirable. It was not good because the, have you ever tried to taste water that is neither hot nor cold, just there and see how distasteful that water is? And the Lord says, I will spew you out because it's something unpleasant to drink. I'm going to spew out the lukewarm water because it's disgusting. So the Lord is saying, I'm going to reject those who, who play both who play, who are neither for nor against. Make, stand your ground, ground. Are you for faith? Are you for unbelief? Are you for Jesus? Or are you for the world and the devil? Are you holy or unholy? Stop playing both because, and I have a feeling and I, I want to believe that most of us Christians play lukewarm and kind of like we play it safe, but the Lord is very, very clear there is not a single lukewarm Christian will be accepted in heaven. He said he's going to reject them. So I think it's a call for for seriousness for Christians to take up side and take up the call of Joshua. Who is on the Lord's side? Decide this day whom you're going to serve. But for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He made a stand to be hot for God. So I think it's the same call of Joshua. That today we have to decide to be holy. We have to decide to follow Christ. Not to be distasteful. But to be whom he has called us to be. And we know whom he has called us to be. He has called us to be holy. He has called us to be faithful. He has called us to do the good works. His greater works in this world. To represent. Uh, he has called us to represent God the Father on this earth, we are ambassadors for God. So, and we have to be that. We can't play both. We can't have one foot in the Holy Spirit and one foot in the world. That's being lukewarm. And the Lord does not tolerate. In the end, on the judgment day, or the day when you're recalled, you know, the day when you're recalled, if you were lukewarm, you can expect Jesus to spew you. And I, I want to believe these are the same people who said, Lord, Lord, we prayed in your name. Lord, Lord, we prophesied in your name. Lord, Lord, we preached in your name. Lord, Lord, we cast demons in your name. I believe they genuinely prophesied. I believe they genuinely dro drove out demons because of the name of Jesus. But their lifestyle was a double-minded lifestyle. I think Apostle James deals with that pretty nice. 
being double-minded, being hot and cold at the same time, blessing and cursing at the same time. Uh, I think all of us have fallen prey to that. I have fallen prey to that. We need to repent and take a side like Joshua. So I think that's a huge lesson for us in the, in the contemporary Christian world, not to be lukewarm and to take the word of God because Jesus introduces himself as the word of God, to take the word of God. The word of God, we should consume, live, breathe, see, hear the word of God all the time. This is going to keep us on the right track, being hot for Jesus, not being cold or being lukewarm. Jesus kind of like is preferring you to take your, take your f f fill, you know, enjoy this world. This is all the best you could do. Be cold and have it all. Take up that mind. Make up your mind to be just cold for God. You don't want anything to do with God. Have your best time here and prepare to go where you want to be. Jesus kind of like is saying these are better. But being lukewarm is kind of like a disappointment and a waste of time. That's why the Lord wants us to take a stand to be hot for God, to be one with God, to be one mind of one mind, not double minded. This church we talked about, Laodicea, was a very wealthy church. And they used to say, you know, we have all the wealth, we have all the goods, we have we, we have the riches, we have the money, we are comfortable, we you know, we have the luxuries in life. But the Lord would go ahead and say, the wealth you're touting, the, the you know, the touting and, 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 and bragging about, it's nothing. Actually, the real wealth, the riches are in me. If you want to have free, you can buy it free. Buying free means just getting it. You get true riches is if you're rich towards God. True riches is being rich toward Jesus Christ. He said, even the the the, the medical school that was producing the eye salve, this salve for the for their was supposed to heal their eyes. He said, the real the the real salve is when you come to me and 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 I apply some salve on you, so you're able to see spiritually, and you stop being double-minded. So. Spiritual sight is better than the physical sight. Yes, I know for me, I use glasses to see, to help my sight well enough. But importantly, I should be able to have the spiritual eyes to discern the things of God and the things of the world. So I make, I know the will of God and choose the right things. Discernment, the spiritual eyes to see, the spiritual ears to hear, and the spiritual heart to perceive. The spiritual heart to perceive when God speaks and to obey. That's the most important thing. So are you rich towards God? Are you, or are your eyes open towards God? The spiritual eyes. Are your ears open towards hearing God? Is your heart able to perceive God? Pray for this type of seeing. Pray for this wisdom. Not just the wisdom of the world. The wisdom of the spirit. To see, to hear, to perceive. Hallelujah. 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 So, Laodiceans, they have they had the banking industry and they had the wealth. What does Jesus promise? What is Jesus saying? That's not the real wealth. It's you might as well have it on this earth because you need it. But the spiritual gold and treasure is with me, is with Jesus Christ. They had the clothing manufacturing industry, but to Jesus, that's not the real clothes you need. Yes, you need to wear. I'm wearing one. But the real clothing is a white garment of true righteousness in Jesus Christ. The spiritual clothing. They had the pharmaceutical salves for the eyes, you know, the ointment, medicine. Jesus says, spiritual eyes anointing belongs to him. He makes you see spiritually. So the only way to come out of this, to come out of this lukewarmness and, and indifference is to repent and to become zealous. You know what? That zeal, that desire, that that heart that follows hard after God. You know, like David, he followed hard after God. He pressed on. We have to press our, ourselves to go to God. We have to press hard to know God. Prophet Hosea would say, let us press hard and press forth to know God. Because he said, without the knowledge of God, people perish. People are destroyed for lack of wisdom. What is wisdom? Wisdom to know God. Press hard, he said. Zeal. 
So sometimes, you know, as Christians, we have no zeal. You find Christians who are just, yeah, I pray. You people are too much, man. You guys keep preaching, keep shouting on us, keep, keep bringing us this. You know, people have literally no zeal. But God is saying, have zeal, repent and have zeal, lively faith. Some of our faith are not lively, you know. It's not active and it's not lively. Some of us are just too dull to be to be authentic. God is calling us to repent and to be zealous. Jesus promises the church of Laodicea who repent and become zealous and get away from lukewarmness that he's going to sit with Jesus. We're going to sit with him on the throne of the Father. What a privilege. What a privilege. What a promise to follow after. So be very, very careful here about lukewarmness. I guess this, for me, this is the most significant church. I love talking about this church because most of us, uh, most of us do fall in this category of just being lukewarm or, you know, half-hearted and, and different and just casual, very, very casual, no zeal, you know, no repentance, just being there, there and just hoping things are going to be. And it would be a disappointment if the Lord has to spew you as this distasteful water that has no taste, you know, just water that is disgusting because it's, it's not cold. It's not hot. It's just there, there. You know what I mean? So important to learn to be one mind, to be zealous about God and to choose one way and to stand for something lest we fall for anything. It's important to say that, to, it's imp important for me to say here that Jesus was saying to the lukewarm that he's constantly knocking at the door. Remember, only you has the key to your door. God is not going to force himself. Jesus is not breaking the door of your heart to try to speak to you. He won't do that. God is love and love implies he gives us free will and free will means will choice so choice is love choice and love are you know intertwined so jesus is knocking from the outside of the door and once you open up he'll remove once you open up make a choice not to be lukewarm to be zealous for him that's opening the door repenting and being zealous means you have opened the door to jesus he'll come he'll 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 eat with you in your heart you know, when he comes in your heart, meaning to eat with you in your heart means he'll always be there present because you have made a choice to be one minded about God. And that's how you get up to the promise of sitting with the Lord on the throne of, of his glory. And what a promise. What a promise. So Jesus is looking for fellowship. When he say when he when the, when the Lord is saying, I'm knocking at your door every hour, every minute, waiting for you to just make that choice, not to be lukewarm, not to be half-half. Make that choice, I need fellowship. So Jesus is looking for constant fellowship, day in, day out, with you. What a mighty God we serve. Are you willing to let the Lord enter you and have a fellowship with you every day? Hallelujah. Open up your heart. For those who are not saved, I urge you now, that at the end of the seven letters of the churches in this uh, series three, I call you to bow down your heads even right now before I end this video. Let us repent together. Let us be zealous, repent and accept the Lord Jesus Christ to call the, the seven spirit of the Lord to remove the deadness in us, to remove the lukewarmness. Those who backslide, those who, who, who lead double life, time's up. God is calling you for uh, relationship he's knocking at the door and someone who is knocking it's 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 humbling himself it's coming at your door it's giving you the respect imagine the god of heaven is at your door knocking what does it signify love humility of the lord his constant desire to i, I believe for me god never stops knocking on any man's door until the last minute you have to take your last breath. It's just us who never opens the door. And I'm here just to sensitize you and me. Open the door now and see the goodness of the Lord. See him supping with you, eating with you, fellowshipping with you, giving you the joy, removing the depression, removing the addictions, removing these things that are holding you back, that, are, that make, made you backslide, made you go back, heal you of your backsliding. 
And if you're not born again, he'll heal you, give you the peace. You shall enjoy. The burden of the Lord is very light. He said, the light you're carrying, the load you're carrying, or light, uh, the, the load you're carrying right now, it's so heavy. It's a load of addiction. It's a load of condemnation. It's a load of, of, of trouble. The Lord wants to take that to open the door. He'll enter. He'll give you a very light load. You know what's a load? Fellowship with me. Make some time with me. That's a, that's a burden. Making time out of your 24-hour schedule to, to fellowship with the Lord during the day. To sing, to praise and worship and do some good works for the Lord. Wherever He sends you to the poor, to, 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 to the afflicted. The burden is so light. I welcome you to bow your head so we can repent and invite the Lord at this invitation. Father, we repent of all the known and unknown sins before you. Father, we ask in the name of Jesus Christ that you come in. We open the door of our heart. We ask you to come in and sup with us. We ask you to come in, Jesus. With your seven spirit, that the Holy Spirit remove the deadness that is within me. Remove the lukewarmness that is within me. Today, I make up that choice. Just as Joshua, me, with all that is within me, to serve you now and forevermore. Amen. Thank you, Lord. Wash me with your precious blood. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. I am born again. From now on, I shall walk with you. In Jesus' name, thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. Hallelujah. If you pray that prayer, the first thing you do is to find a born-again Christian who you know is born again and tell them that you did that. Or if you know any pastor near you, call them, go to the church on Sunday and tell them I prayed this prayer and they will guide you from here. God bless you, and we shall be going to Revelations uh, series for next. Until next time, God bless.